Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash carnivorecast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. This is a quick disclaimer before we start the show. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said here should be taken as medical advice. And please consult with your physician before making any changes to your diet, exercise regime, or medications. Thank you. And on to the show. Kurt Havens is an expert in bodybuilding pharmacology, performance-enhancing drugs, anabolic steroids, and the science of building muscle. He's currently pursuing his PhD in endocrinology. He's coached and helped countless IFBB pro bodybuilders, competed himself for decades, and written eBooks and courses on HGH and anabolics mastery. Kurt has an excellent YouTube channel where he discusses science and interviews experts and bodybuilders. Kurt was on the show before where we dove into a wide range of topics from injectable L-carnitine to Masteron and DHDs to magnesium and more. Welcome back to the show, Kurt. Hey, thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of Always course. To and today we're going to dive into everything around blood glucose management, dysregulation, as well as strategies to help manage it from lifestyle and nutrition interventions to supplementation and pharmacology um, but before that, I wanted to ask you a couple questions. Uh, you had mentioned starting a forum. So I wanted to ask you where mm-hmm. you got that idea and, and how, how it's going. Uh, one of my clients in Thailand is an avid reader of all things bodybuilding and follows like every bit of content that he can get his hands on. Cool. And he got the idea. We were talking about ways to, to grow my business so I can have a bigger impact on, a, on a, a wider audience outside of coaching, right? Because coaching is narrow. Like yeah. at the end of the day, not everyone can have coaching or afford coaching. And, you know, and I think you and I can help spread some of the stuff through things like YouTube, right? Because it's accessible and it's free. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you still need to make some level of money with some information. So we were looking, his idea was to grow the, the lower end of my business so I could still have some income coming in from it, but it would be at a very low price point. And we were looking at uh, Train by JP. So I yeah. think that's how he does most of his stuff. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the initial thought. And so my wife is a web designer, so she's working on the back end of that. It's it's probably close to being done. It's just a lot of back end decisions that I have to get made. Yeah. And I want to make sure just correctly. But it was I just really wanted to be a community based thing with some exclusive content and I was going to use it as a library of knowledge too. So I can put links to some studies, some studies that have been redacted or things that aren't public per se access, like depending on permissions, I have to get permissions for a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, Or, or just things that maybe people don't know how to find the data on, like some of the original Trembolone data, some of the equipoise data from the seventies, just things that have been removed off the internet. Yeah. Um, And just so there can be, I want to have a whole section with anabolic steroids and just as in-depth as I can make each compound, like a full description comparison, like why would you choose this over this? You want to benefit the pros and cons of all those things. And I just think it would be kind of a cool place where we could all spend time and learn. And hopefully it's a safe, you know, in, in the safest manner possible. That's yeah. kind of the goal. Right? It's like, we all have these goals. Like, you know, you want to get your pro card and stuff, but at the end of the day, you, you don't want to harm yourself. So. That's, yeah. you know, I think you and I are very similar in that is that we have these goals to look a certain way, but it's, it's about longevity too. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I've seen how much you've helped so many people and I think it'll be awesome. I, I'm sure you'll be in there helping people every day. And I think that's really the value of these forums. I'm, I moderate a couple 
forums like this. Um, and I, I absolutely love it. I love being in there, being able to help people, being able to answer questions. And what you'll find, I think, which is really interesting is for every active person asking questions, there are like 20 or 30 inactive people just absorbing the information. Um, so you're helping even more people than you know. Uh, so it's a really cool way to, to learn and to teach. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and I was going to talk to you about that as well. If you wanted to be part of this in the beginning, yeah, I was trying I, to find as many people from different backgrounds that, you know, have knowledge about this stuff that want to help. So I'd I love to help in any small way I can. So, yeah. I mean, we can give the audience, I'll link stuff up obviously when it, when it goes cool. live. Stuff. Yeah. So I'll definitely share it. Great. It just, Great. I'm spending that's a lot of time on Instagram and it would be nice to spend it in, in a more specific group, I think. Yeah. I think, I think you'll enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> um, cool. Well, let's, let's talk about blood glucose. Um, what causes elevations in blood glucose, both acutely and longer term? Okay. Um, so as far as, because we're referring this as insulin resistance, basically. Is yes. What the issue is right. So, I, uh, I mean, long story short, it's the two, it's, it's basically eating too much and for too prolonged of a period of time to make it as simple as possible. Basically, the body can't keep up with the food that's coming in um, and your body can no longer, if, if your glycogen stores are full, your body can no longer push the glucose anywhere. So it's going to stay in the blood right until it can circulate back through the liver again. And hopefully the liver then has room at that point. If it doesn't, then it's going to get turned to a triglyceride. So you typically see in cases of high blood glucose, over time, you'll see triglycerides elevate as well, right? And that's when metabolic syndrome really becomes a thing. And as we look at some of the drugs we were going to talk about, that's kind of the purpose of some of these things is to kind of mitigate all of those horrible things that can occur. Um, so yeah, so like I, we were talking about like some like post-show rebound stuff with food, right? So if you go from a very strict diet, even though you technically you're more insulin sensitive when you come off stage, if you go from eating 100 grams of carbs a day to 1,000 grams of carbs a day for you know a prolonged period of time, your body's going to fight back to some extent. It just doesn't know what to do with that, right? Yeah. We only have we have a limited we have endless amounts of fat storage in the human body. We have a very limited amount of glycogen storage. Yeah, and what can cause like stepping outside of well, I guess bodybuilders too, but someone who's you know eating relatively the same amount and the same types of foods for a long period of time. And seems to have no problem with it. And then, you know, either develops diabetes or just a uh, milder form pre-diabetes or blood glucose management issues. Like, why does that seem to develop over time? Is it just that the cumulative effect of doing this for long periods of time? Is it age? Is it, can it be something else? What, what leads it's, to that? It's multifactorable. So it's age, which age is going to play a, t- a toll on some of these things, right? Our organs just don't work as well. Things are not as receptive. Um, you're going to, um, you're going to experience different gut uh, microbiome changes and things. Like we've now found that even dietary fat can cause insulin resistance and not directly through fat molecules traveling in our blood, but what they're doing inside of our gut changes the, the environment and that can change the way your body uses insulin as well. Um, it's just all these things we tend to be, what you, you hear a lot of people say is they get, it's so almost 50. A lot of people might will talk about their metabolism being slower now than it is when they were in their twenties. And that's actually not the case. We don't really find metabolic slowdown. So people really enter the, their sixties. So what mm. happens is we just move less. Like mm. you and I are aware of our movement, right? You probably track your steps. You yeah. do some sort of cardio, you do these things, but the average person doesn't, they don't move at all. Right. And when you're a kid, when you're 18 years old, you're constantly moving around. When you're younger than that, you're playing sports, most likely. You have gym class, you have programmed exercise throughout your day. So you're just moving less. So you're not clearing the glucose out of your blood as you get older if you're sitting down right. all day. Um, so it's, it's, mo- it's most likely just lifestyle changes that are occurring. Even if the food is the same, if your output is different, reduced, it's going to cause, you know, some level of insulin resistance. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And what drugs can cause elevated blood glucose? Are there things bodybuilders take or um, the average person is taking that may lead to some of these issues as well? Growth hormone, for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, albog steroids can 
play a role there as well, but that's not as big of a role and that's not as common, but growth hormone for sure. You see it fairly often. Um, usually you don't see it in fasting glucose as much as you see it in A1C. So like if someone's using, let's just a round number, so you're using 10 units of growth hormone a day, you might see your A1C wave goes from like a five to a five, five over because the, the average elevation is higher than it was previously before using the growth hormone or at that level, but your body's still generally able to snap back with a fasted glucose and still keep it lower. Where we start to, where we start to be concerned is when the fasted glucose starts to creep up is what, when you testing your fasted glucose and that's starting to noticeably creep up. Yeah. Right. And so again, this is like some of the stuff we talked about. We just start to observe yeah. those changes, but it's, th that's why we get labs. That's why we test these things, right? So you're aware of it before it becomes bad because you're not generally going to feel a certain way at a 120 glucose different than you would at an 80 or 90. You generally mm. don't start to feel horrible. Yeah. It's significantly elevated at that point. It's pretty late. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one thing I should have asked earlier, but um, the difference between uh, blood glucose and I don't even know what the right term for it is. But these continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, mm -hmm. um, I heard a podcast where um, Skip Hill and Andrew Barry were talking about them. And Andrew Barry was saying he really wasn't a fan of CGMs because they're not actually monitoring your blood glucose. They're measuring something else. It's like the, the, the um, glucose in your muscles yeah. instead of in your oh, blood. Which is probably using a calculated average. Yeah. So it's, it's delayed not, in other words. So like if, yeah. if you're using that as like a diabetic to manage your insulin and you, you see it elevated, it may be an hour too late because it actually isn't as accurate as checking it with a finger prick, um, getting an instant blood glucose. And unless you have an issue that you know about using the continuous glucose monitor to me seems a little silly. It, mm. I, it, I think it feeds into some disordered thinking that we see in bodybuilding, right? There's a lot of obsessive compulsive behavior that yeah. we're all surrounded with time. And I, I worry that that sort of stuff becomes another obsession that we're worried about. Your blood glucose yeah. is going to constantly move. You'd be dead if it weren't constantly moving. Yeah. You know, same with your insulin response. It has to move. So what people are actually trying to measure, if you're not diabetic, I'm not really sure because it should constantly be going up and down. Yeah. I think in a case where someone has switched to growth hormone dose or using something else that can mess with it. I, I do think it's a wise idea to check until you get to some sort of baseline where you can see what your body's doing. So you know if that's a good dose for you or not. Um, but running this, running these things that are, you know, it's basically someone decided to sell diabetic technology to regular people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it can be helpful for someone who's uneducated, who's like a pre-diabetic just to see, to get a sense of like what causes the biggest elevations in blood glucose for them. Um, like maybe um, when they eat banana, their blood glucose goes crazy high, but you know, having strawberries doesn't seem to affect them or something like that. Maybe it can be a useful tool in those. Or fiber, times. right? The meal has a lot of fiber, a lot of protein. It's probably not going to go as high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've, we've kind of talked about all these things as we've gone along, but what lifestyle and nutrition interventions can help with blood glucose management? You mentioned more activity. You mentioned not overeating. Um, are there, are there changes to diet that can help manage blood glucose as well? Yeah. Uh, well, and outside of that too, just staying leaner. Yeah. Right. So you, as a man, I generally, I speak, uh, generally to men. So. I apologize for women listening to this. We, we can always do a separate one on women's health stuff. Uh, for men, you want to stay below 15% body fat. There's really no excuse for any man to be above that at any point. It's not going to be advantageous for growing muscle. And you, we know that at 15% and above, there's some chronic level of inflammation and oxidative stress that's occurring. And that's that magnifies all these metabolic disorders mm. when you have that situation. So that's part of the reason where that's part of the cause of the insulin resistance is the cells basically are inflamed glut four, which is the transport that you and I are concerned with can't translocate to the cell membrane because it's, it's basically thickened. Yeah. So it can't actually allow glucose in, even if there's room and it wants to, it, it's not working the same way. Right. Like yeah. you've noticed the funny thing you see in bodybuilders is if you do your off season correctly and you don't really destroy your health, right? Like the, the, the more modern way that people do it, you know, using testin and anabolic and some growth hormone, perhaps some insulin, depending on your needs, 
you know, and you're, but you're not using orals. You're not doing anything dumb. You're not using trend. You're taking decent care of yourself. You're getting good sleep, right? You're not getting overly fat, but you're, you're growing, you're doing a healthy. And then you go into prep and all of a sudden you start using what on the surface looks like more toxic chemicals, right? This orals and some of the chemicals are a little stronger, like Trembolone and Winstrol. Um, yeah. And you would expect to see people's health start to go down the toilet. But a lot of times you'll actually see their health markers start to improve because they get leaner. Mm. So at least sometimes it nets out even. I don't, you and I have looked at your blood work before. I don't remember, but you never were unhealthy. No. Right. I mean, liver things, I think are going to get skewed. That's part of prep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it was, it, that it was, was very like, well managed during, during prep for me. Um, yeah. I think that that's part of and just staying naturally leaner. So uh, cardio food stuff, um, you pretty much want to do what, I mean, similar to what someone with diabetes would do, right? You want to eat smaller meals more frequently. You want to use more complex carbohydrates with some level of fiber in them to start, you know, you rather than eat like white bread where you're going to get a huge spike, right? And then yeah. a huge drop, like use oatmeal, things like that that can kind of control blood sugar slightly yeah. better. Thing, adding protein in. So technically if you add fat to it, a carbohydrate also slow that response as well. But for people that are into fitness, generally you don't want to mix a ton of fat into your carbohydrates, right? Yeah. If you care about what you look like. So what we would, you and I would typically do is we would add protein to our meals, right? You would never eat. I don't know of any bodybuilder who eats a white potato alone, <laughs> right? They're generally about yeah. potato with chicken or with some yeah. sort of meat. And that's also why we don't look at the glycemic index anymore, that that's an yeah. irrelevant scale for us because those, when they determine those ratios or those ratings, they basically fasted people for over 24 hours and then fed them those individual foods alone. Yeah, it's so clearly it's going to be a huge insulin response. So no one eats like that. Yeah. Um, so it's more just a mixture, you know, a proper ratio of food, uh, you know, adding you know, fruits and vegetables, things that have natural fiber in them um, versus just eating. You know, if you were to eat just a big old bowl of white rice alone, clearly your blood sugar is going to elevate. Yeah. And, um, and to that point, um, does like, especially if for someone who's diabetic, does the order in which you eat your meal matter? Like I imagine someone who's diabetic goes to a restaurant, they serve the bread, you're eating the bread fasted. That's going to versus having like your protein first and a vegetable and then eating your carbs. Right. Yeah. So that's, and that's like, that was how I learned how to eat as well. So you generally eat your, you want to eat your protein first. Right. Yeah. If there's fat, you generally eat that first as well, because it's going to slow down that response. And then you eat your carbohydrates. Yeah. Second. And there's not that there's anything wrong with eating, you know, around your plate in a haphazard manner. But yeah, if you're worried about blood sugar, it makes more sense to eat things you're going to slow digestion down first and then move on yeah. to it. So yeah, in a restaurant, it's the worst because they give you the stuff that's going to screw with your blood sugar immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Um, and, and going back a second, um, just because... I asked like what drugs affect blood sugar and you mentioned um, growth hormone, especially, but I would imagine most anabolic steroids on average actually improve blood glucose management, right? Um, they can like yeah, yeah. in normal people. Yeah. Yeah. To that end, like would menopause going through menopause because that decreases the availability of a lot of hormones in women Would that potentially skew blood glucose management. Um, it cannot, it cannot on a couple different fronts. Estrogen is going to aid in, in, um, glycogen storage to some degree. What you also see is then women's fat pattern storage changes during menopause. So they, they mm. start to have more central, uh, you know, adipose storage versus like, a, like the, the typical gynoid with uh, the hips and the legs. So as that changes, that tends to change insulin sensitivity as well. So you will okay. see that, but it's not necessarily menopause. I don't want to say menopause itself will do that, but it, I think just as a whole metabolic thing, there's a huge shift in their body. Yeah. Makes sense. That's why it's easier to speak to men's health because our bodies are much simpler. Yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. Um, what over the counter supplements can help with managing blood glucose? Um, berberine for sure. Um, uh, I use, I put cinnamon on things in oatmeal. Um, there are uh, red, oh, what, what is it? Um, the, it's not red yeast, red, um, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm drawing a blank. Curcumin or something else? 
Uh, I'm not sure if curcumin actually does or okay. not. Red, uh, is it yeast? Yeast rice. Red yeast rice seems okay. to have a relatively profound effect on blood sugar. It's not as known. Okay. Um, but I've seen, I've seen some recent stuff where it's actually made, you can actually see it in people's blood work. So that's an option too. I think berberine is the most common one that people Chromium as well. Isn't that a common one? Um, it can to an extent. And that was big yeah. in the nineties. Um, there's nothing wrong with using it. And it's pro- if you're taking a high quality multivitamin, you're, you're probably getting some level of chromium picolinate yeah. anyway. Alpha lipolic acid can have an effect on it as well. Okay. Um, that being said, it's alpha lipolic acid is a very strong antioxidant. I don't, I wouldn't personally take it all the time. Yeah. It'd be something I would use. Like if you felt something coming on. Okay. Makes sense. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, outside of Burberry, I mean, if you're really struggling, if your blood sugar is really getting out of hand and something like Burberry is not covering it, rather than immediately jump to something like metformin or a drug, it'd probably take a look at your lifestyle habits first. Yeah. Right? Like, I think this is part of the problem is in the bodybuilding community, we all love to self-medicate and self-diagnose yeah. these things. And we don't ever see doctors. We just want to go because we seem to have access to all these things on the street. So then we'll just start taking drugs without understanding yeah. them. Yeah, and that—that's just my concern. Is that, it, or at least speak to someone who understands this stuff before you go medicate with stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's an issue because it could be something else causing these problems. Yeah, and then ironically, my next question was about drugs. <laughs> but sure. assuming other lifestyle factors are in order, what drugs can be helpful in blood glucose management? Um, let, maybe let's save metformin for last. Um, okay. Do ARBs or have any? impact on blood glucose or are there other drugs besides metformin that can be effective in managing? ARB would be more for metabolic syndrome per se than, than directly on glucose. Um, But those things, high blood pressure and those things all go together, especially like as we start, as I believe at some point in the conversation, we're going to go toward like dementia and things like that as well. So like those things play a role in that. Um, Obviously insulin, right. But again, like, and so it has a lot of risks associated with it. You just need to really know what you're doing. This way yeah. I don't really advocate it or give advice on insulin usage you know, outside of people that I know. Yeah. Because it, it has a risk. Um, obviously insulin works though. Um, that would be the strongest effect. You know, metformin would be my second choice. I mean, there's all the, all the you know, the new, the GLP, GL, you know, all of those. The oh, other right. Things, yeah. You know, all those kind of things. I, again, those I feel like are, are better probably used for appetite suppression. Yeah. But you have some experience. Like, I feel like they're not really my first choice for people unless appetite yeah. is really the driver of this. Like if you really have, and some people do, they really struggle with their appetite and that's a real thing. Yeah. Like it's not necessarily a willpower thing. There's just some people's bodies just struggle with that. I see the main benefit of those drugs is um, managing the mental side of like hangriness for lack of a better term. Um, like some people, I have a close friend who's a bodybuilder, but whenever he, and, and, you know, he has a very successful career outside of bodybuilding. He has a family, he has all these things he's managing. And whenever he starts a diet, he just goes into like panic mode. And whenever he gets the least bit hungry, he just kind of like gets kind of manic and a little bit crazy. And, um, the way that GLP and GIP agonists work is they can help with basically tricking your body into one slowing digestion, which isn't great for bodybuilders, as you've mentioned many times, but also, um, making your body think it has a stable level of blood glucose when it otherwise may not. Um, and so I think that is one of the useful ways that it can be used in bodybuilding is kind of managing that elevated stress that can sometimes come um, from hunger if someone can't do that already, which to your point, like they should learn to do that (laughs) for bodybuilding. But but if you think about it from like a biological point of view, so the cortisol that we experience during a stressful situation is the same cortisol that you experience during low blood sugar. It's the same thing. So we like to use the terms glucagon and cortisol. They're interchangeable. So right when your blood sugar is low, your, your body releases cortisol to basically free up glucose. So your body can work. So it's very possible that because the feeling technically is the same as stress and low blood sugar. 
So it's possible that if over time when you were a child, especially if you learned to associate the two, it seems like an, an easy an easy thing to go from a stress situation to eating because you're really just trying to get rid of the cortisol. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly. that's really one of the benefits of eating carbohydrates is that ins- insulin is an antagonist to cortisol. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one thing that's uh, talked about with regards to, um, oh, it, one other thing I wanted to say on GLP-1 agonists, I saw an interesting study that was comparing uh, like semaglutide or ozempic to metformin. And it was saying, you know, in this diabetic population, ozempic was way more effective than metformin at managing blood glucose. And I thought to myself, yeah, of course, if you take these unhealthy people who probably have an unhealthy lifestyle and you help them lose, you know, 10 to 20 pounds and you help them get their, get their appetite under control, like, of course, that's going to be more effective at managing their blood glucose than just slapping them with metformin. Yeah, um, not apples so, to apples. Yeah, not yeah exactly. Yeah. I would so, say, I would say in my opinion, metformin is probably a better drug. Yeah. You know, I think that there's a point in things like Wagovi. I'm not against them at yeah, all. Yeah. There is a point. I just think we, we're, we're still new with this stuff. We don't know all the risks, all the side effects, yeah. you know? I, so. I just think that's a, it was funny and it's probably an important consideration because there's probably going to be a lot of research that shows for <laughs> diabetics that those drugs are more effective than metformin, but you have to take into context, like what else changes uh, yeah. that they're not controlling in the study. Well, that's why yeah, with all studies, there's always context, right? Yeah, yeah. You could, you could take a study and prove anything you want. Yeah. yeah. It's always helpful to think when you're looking at a study, like why why else could this have happened? Like what, <laughs> what else could have caused this? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, so talking about um, metformin, what are, what are some of the downsides of something like metformin for bodybuilders or for health in general? Uh, downsides? I mean, outside of, um, I mean, outside of like gastrointestinal upset, stuff like that. I mean, the, the normal side effects that you would get from, uh, I mean, you don't see like lactic acidosis and stuff, typically of bodybuilders, uh, more yeah. in diabetics, um, is mostly gastrointestinal stuff. I, obviously, I, again, I wouldn't use metformin just prophylactically if it's not something that's needed. Yep. Right. Like you should be under a physician's care if you're using something like this. Most doctors that have any understanding of this stuff, which should be most doctors are very willing to prescribe things like this if it's needed. Yeah. It's not a drug they're going to give you grief over. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, someone should just be monitoring your health, but yeah, I don't typically not. I mean, metformin is a very interesting drug. There's even some, some newer studies to show that it even might help with uh, estrogen or hormonal dependent cancers. Interesting. So, I mean, I, it, and it's, the drug has been around since like the 1930s and around for a long time. What about the effects on IGF-1 um, for bodybuilders? So the, the only data on that is in people with diabetes. So in healthy okay. populations, it doesn't really seem to do so. And if you're using things like anabolic steroids or growth hormone or even IGF, uh, you know, Incrolux, you're going to overdo what the metformin would, you know, I, it wouldn't be a concern. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be concerned with that. I would think if you'd be better off, even if it did reduce your IGF slightly, you'd be better off with slightly reduced IGF and more manageable blood sugar than yeah. you out of control blood sugar, right? Yeah. Being diabetic is not going to make you big and muscular. Yeah. Um, what effect can using, uh, let's say, you know, someone is using this with a very smart um, oversight and checking their blood glucose and other lifestyle effects are in order. What long-term effects can using insulin have on blood glucose management? Like, is it going to make you insulin resistant in other words? Like injectable insulin, Humalog, yeah. Humalog R. So Exogenous. It can. So it's, the problem is bodybuilders, again, aren't, look when they're looking at studies, they're not, there's no context there with bodybuilders. So really the data is on people with diabetes. And then there's random ones with burn victims for protein synthesis. So they're trying to take two different metabolic situations that don't really apply to bodybuilding and somehow turn them into a bodybuilding situation. So it's not that you just be careful with it is, is the only thing I, I did. It's not a to B. It doesn't mean using it will cause it just you in the, in the presence when the pancreas no longer needs to do that anymore, it 
will start to downregulate those beta cells. So you you can cause problems by using constantly. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. Something to, so I would say the smartest way to use it again, I'm not advocating it. The smartest way for guys yeah. to use it is if they're carb cycling or something along those lines and they have a high day, leverage it when you really need it. Yeah. Most guys, w- I think where my frustration with insulin comes from is, is twofold. I think you see a lot of coaches recommend it before anabolics, even in women. They're like, wow. oh no, you don't need anabolic. You need to use insulin. It's like, wow, it's really in poor taste to me. And two, you see a lot of younger guys that really have no level of muscularity and they're clearly not eating enough or they don't need that amount of food and they want to leverage insulin. It's not magic. It's yeah. not going to do something that just eating wouldn't do on its own. When you yeah. get to a certain point where you can no longer handle the food that's required to get to that size or hold your size, there are lots of men's open bodybuilders that need to eat a massive amount of food to be 280. Yeah. They require things like insulin actually to handle their food. It's not so much they're using it they're using it for anabolism, but it's but it's almost more required at that point of their growth. Yeah. Unless you were that big, and you would know if you're that big and you need it, right? Yeah. Like if you're really pushing thousands of grams of carbs and you really can't handle that amount of food, then then that's the stage to use it. When you're still using 300 milligrams of testosterone and you've gained a whopping seven pounds of muscle over your baseline, that's not the time to leverage insulin. Yeah, yeah, I, I see a lot of that. It's unfortunate. I mean, that's that's my concern is that long term. What is this generation of bodybuilders going to look like in 20 years from now? Are we even going to be alive? Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. You so. see the worst of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and another class of drugs that's come about uh, that I wanted to get your take on today is the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors. Um, one of the most popular is a drug called Jardiance. Mm-hmm. Um, what is Jardiance and, and uh, what's your interpretation of some of the literature around it? So it's a, um, it's a sodium glucose co-transporter. Um, it basically, it basically blocks that enzyme. So through the kidneys where a lot of the glucose is pulled, it'll basically block that enzyme. So that's, okay. that's its primary action. So it's not working the same as, as metformin at all. They're, they, the outcome can be similar, but the method of action is totally different. Um, it also, um, what's the primary method of action for metformin? It, well, it's, it should it should do a couple of things. It should make you more sensitive to insulin. Okay. It should lower blood glucose. And it, it actually has an effect on appetite as well through something called uh, GDF15. It's a gene growth differentiation factor 15. So okay. it should have some effect on appetite. How much? I've never used it. So I can't, I mean, you can, I can ask people who've used it, but, but you're yeah. going to get different responses depending on someone, right? Like, as you know, some people need a drug like Wagovi to control their appetite and other people. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they could drink water before a meal and be stuffed. Yeah, um, I don't think it has as strong as of an effect on um, on appetite as something like uh, was that No, it's mild. I've used, I use it, and it's very mild effect, mild to no effect on appetite for me. But I, it depends person to person too. Some people report much much more effect on their appetite. Yeah. So it basically the, the Jardians basically just makes you excrete your uh, sugar through your urine. So okay. it's clearing blood sugar by a lot, by forcing your kidneys to not reabsorb. So a huge amount of sugar is reabsorbed through the kidneys and it's preventing okay. that, that enzyme basically from doing that. And just, you're passing it out. Right. So in a normal person, you're not really peeing out a ton of glucose. In this case, yeah. it's basically flipping that around. Whereas um, with metformin, it's helping your body produce the right yep. amount of insulin. Yep. So it's, you're not, so you are still absorbing the glucose. It's just it's just pushing it correctly. Yeah, and we don't honestly okay. know the mechanisms of action, all the mechanisms of action of metformin. And it was in yeah, sure. 22. I was wrong. Yeah. Guys at first. It's been around for a long time. We don't fully understand it. Got it. Kind of shows you how little we really know about a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, so there were two studies uh, that I sent you. One was um, just looking at the drug in type 2 diabetics. And uh, interestingly, it, it talked about the significantly lower risk of dementia um, while using this drug, which I thought was really interesting, as well as um, they looked at, yeah, they looked at vascular dementia, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, can you talk about how this may have affected these dementia markers and how sure. this drug or, or other drugs or blood glucose in general may sure. help with dementia. 
So uh, Alzheimer's is now considered to be, they, it's now being called diabetes type three. I don't mm. know if you've heard this. Yeah. So we found that there's a ton of similarities between the two. So there's really three, there's really three main mechanisms at play here. So you would have, and this kind of goes back to when you said ARBs earlier. So you high blood pressure, right? So the higher your blood pressure gets, increases your risk of a stroke. Well, when you have strokes, you tend to increase dementia risk. So that's the most obvious. Um, hypoglycemia um, will cause, can cause basically the hippocampus part of the brain, which is where memories are formed. It will start to destroy that. So if insulin or blood sugar is poorly managed over a period of time, you'll basically destroy the memory center of the brain. Interesting. And the, the, um, the third one that's like the most direct is um, insulin basically regulates the phosphorylation of tau and so an amyloid plaque. So that, that when insulin levels are not correct, they basically cause the, the say, say this is what people were blaming were, were claiming that was happening with trembolone was this amyloid plaque buildup in the brain, whether that actually occurs or not is a whole other topic. But um, so when you have diabetes, just any mismanaged insulin or blood sugar amounts will start to destroy the brain and cause these issues. So, and you see a huge correlation between people that have diabetes developing Alzheimer's later in life. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's most likely what that's, that's really all that study was doing in that study. They don't specifically talk about any of those things though. Right. I feel like they yeah. kind of left it to the reader. Yeah. You already know that or you're supposed yeah. to then do further research because yeah. they yeah. they're not very specific as to what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Yeah. I, I have, I, I've talked about it before on this podcast, but um, dementia and Alzheimer's is probably my biggest fear in terms of health risks uh, because it runs in my family and I've seen it just emotionally destroy people, um, especially the people around the person who's affected by it. Very scary. And um, unfortunately so many things that contribute to it this is just one right yeah i don't think anyone's gonna ever claim to know the what fully causes it or you know there's yeah. so many things that we can do to trophy prevent it you know or or other lifestyle things but unfortunately it's it's yeah it's a really horrible horrible disease yeah um and then the other was comparing uh this drug jardiance with metformin um on cardiovascular and renal outcomes in patients with diabetes um, can you talk about this study and, and how you interpreted it? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling the study up really fast. Sure. Look again. Um, Cause it was a large, there were 2000 people, I believe. Yeah. It was a nationwide cohort study, 38,000 patients. <laughs> 50% men, uh, average age was 62 plus or minus 11.6 years, or maybe that's median age. Um, but yeah, it compared um, 2,000 patients receiving metformin and roughly 1,000 patients receiving SGLT2 inhibitor on all-cause mortality, cardiovascular death, stroke, renal disease. Yeah, again, it's going to be through vascular stuff like blood pressure. So it's going to have more of an effect on that. Than, yeah. than something like and so it's really just through through that mechanism of blood pressure um, so do you think like there's obviously and and you talked about some of the risks of people just hopping on metformin as bodybuilders and you know including metformin and telmasartan um just as like a cookie cutter approach to uh stack design um but in in case where you know we are managing lifestyle factors and someone is using these drugs interventionally um, in a bodybuilding setting, do you think Jardiance potentially has more utility than metformin or similar? How do you kind of view them or how would you compare them? It's interesting. My gut would be on metformin first. Mm -hmm. um, um, is there a reason why you would, you would, you were looking at using Jardiance over metformin? No, I, I just found it interesting. You know, I was just trying to learn about it. I, I, to be honest, my inclination was to lean more towards metformin because it is so well studied, so widely used. Um, 
you're right, we don't know all the mechanisms of action and all the downstream effects, but uh, you know, we do know some of the main risks and side effects pretty well. Um, this is not a new drug, but it's newer than metformin and not as widely used. Um, so I think it's interesting. Um, but uh I I obviously I, I want to dig a lot more into the literature myself and learn more about it. Uh, but no, there wasn't a particular reason why okay. I was looking at using it um, over metformin. Okay. I mean, I, I, w- I would say metformin, I think, would be my first call. And yeah. then something like Jardines would be second. Um, but again, then with most bodybuilders, they're probably going to use insulin before either of those. Right? Yeah. Jardines is probably the third line. Metformin would probably be either first or second, depending on the person. Sometimes yeah. you see them both used, depending on the person. Um, and usually at a lower dose, di- diabetics a lot of times will get a much bigger dose of metformin than a bodybuilder would get, right? Bodybuilders typically take you know, like a thousand milligrams maximum or something. Diabetics will get, you know, 2,000. Could, could um, Jardians pot- potentially be more counterproductive to bodybuilders because you're excreting some of the glucose? I mean, that's uh, kind of a thought I had. I didn't want to say that because I don't know if that's yeah. what would the outcome would be. It yeah. does seem a little counterproductive, though, if you're just going to excrete glucose yeah. right? instead of actually making your pancreas work more efficiently, because that seems to be the problem with bodybuilders. Unless you're starting this game in a place where your pancreas isn't functioning correctly or you're already yeah. diabetic, I think for a guy like you or I, it really is just a function of how much food you can handle and what your organs can do with the food, how much yeah. you can sell it. To me, if you can make your organs more efficient, that seems like a wiser move to me than just excreting the excess. Because then at that point, I would say, well, don't need a thousand grams of carbs, you 500 grams of carbs, and you don't have to yeah. take a drug to manage that. Yeah. Um, that would be my gut feeling. So I would, I would probably go metformin first. Yeah. 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 So no, diabetic, though, I think I, the Jardians is a great drug if someone is diabetic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, and shifting topics a little bit. Uh, th- thank you. First of all, like if it's not clear to the audience, like obviously consult with your doctor. I have the medical disclaimer at the start of every episode, but it's not medical advice. And, um, you know, we, we both are still trying to learn more on this new class of drugs. So, so please don't take our word as final on, on any of this. Um, but one thing you've talked about on several podcasts and I'm learning myself is we both have a distinct disadvantage in bodybuilding and that we need so much food. (laughs) Um, like you've talked about needing 2000 grams of carbs, um, you know, sitting in the low to mid two hundreds, um, and very lean. Um, and you know, I'm immediately post show and I'm already over 5,000 calories. Um, how has that affected that and your age? And like you talked about finding ways to help more people, how has that affected your view on your own competitive career and like how you're thinking about that going forward? Um, so yeah, um, I mean, my competitive career is probably done at this point. It's not to say that I wouldn't possibly consider. I originally was going to do something this summer. It just, I've been too busy and, and kind of that has, um, the desire is not fully there anymore. I think there comes a point where you just, I, I realize that I'm, I'm probably more useful as a coach and as a mentor than I am as a competitor. I am never a great athlete to begin with. So the, the health risks, I don't know if they're really worth it anymore. I yeah. think, I mean, at the end of the day, what bodybuilding really is, is it's a genetic response to food, drugs, and training, right? The better, and people don't want to hear this, but the better genetics you have for bodybuilding, the better and less, you, you, the less food you need, the less training you need, and the less gear you need. I know people yeah. think that pro bodybuilders, I'll go off on a training thing for a second, just so people can understand this, because I, <laughs> I think the desire and need are two different things. I think when people look at, pro bodybuilders that train for 20 hours a week, that doesn't mean that they need to. That means that they probably want to. And drugs mask these effects and allow it to work, right? If you're natural, that ain't ever going to work. The truly gifted ones don't need a ton of exercise. If you're all fast twitch fiber, which is what would be ideal, you technically don't need a ton of stimulation. Same with drugs and same with food. And this is why across the pros that I've worked with or, or talked to, you see a great variance in the amount of steroids that these guys use. There are some guys that use less than a gram. There are other guys who use 10,000 milligrams. So it really depends. And again, is that that's not necessarily a need. Sometimes that's a want or abusive behavior, right? Because we are in a, in a world that more is better and bodybuilding tends to attract people with, you know, obsessive behavior. 
Um, yeah, food. I mean, for you and I both, I mean, that's our limiting factor. If you and I clearly respond to exercise, right? You respond to gear. Yeah. If you and I were more efficient in what our bodies could do with food, just think about how fa- fast you could grow. Yeah. Right. So this is what probably guys, I'm just guessing, guys like Flex Wheeler, Lee Priest were just very efficient. Dorian Yates all oh, around yeah. with everything yeah. that they did. All the stimulus resulted in a response versus you and I have to eat more than a, you know, a small family just to, you know, put on a couple of pounds. So it becomes yeah. really a challenge at a certain point. Um, yeah. And that's what happened to me when I got into the more mid two hundreds, it just, the amount of food was just unrealistic and yeah, I just yeah. didn't feel great doing that. Yeah. So it, you know, that's at yeah. least for me, that's the biggest, but if you're, you know, if you're younger and, and you still want to pursue that and that's the situation for someone, I mean, that doesn't mean you can't pursue it. So just eat more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's really, um, obviously mature of you and, and, uh, really meaningful that you're able to help so many people in so many different ways, like do this healthier, um, do this smarter, educate themselves in a world where there is a lot of misinformation. Um, and you can have such a profound effect on people and get so much meaning from that yourself. Uh, I think that's really awesome. Um, you know, I, I hope to do more of that myself in the future, and I'm sure I will find it equally or more rewarding than my own bodybuilding pursuits for now. I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, excited and have the fire in me to, to give it a shot for a few more years. Uh, I only did my first show a month ago. Uh, but yeah, I can certainly see how, you know, it's like running a car, how, how hard do you have to run that car, um, to complete the same journey, to complete the same race. And all those things have an effect on you. If you can get away with, you know, only needing to eat so much food or only needing to train so hard, um, it's just going to be a lot easier journey and have less of a toll on your body longer term. Yeah. And when look and you won and you won your first show. So you do have quite a future ahead of you. Thank you. you. So yeah, it's got to be exciting to see where it goes. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Kurt. Um, really appreciate your insights on this topic. As always, um, super intelligent and well-spoken. And um, yeah, for folks who aren't following Kurt's channel, uh, I don't know why not. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of great interviews and topics. Recently did a deep dive on um, how to interpret blood work, which I think is very underappreciated um, and was a great crash course for people with Colton Lukes, who's also a guest on this podcast. So definitely go check that out. And I'll have links to everything for Kurt in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to direct people to, Kurt? Uh, no, I mean, I have a book. We'll be working on that form soon. Um, you'll have information on that. You can you know, pass around when that goes uh, live. No, I mean, I'm mostly active on Instagram. If you want to find me, that's probably the easiest way. Or they can email me at uh, Kurt at AtomicLifeCoaching.com. That's my website. But, um, but yeah, I, I try to respond to everyone who reaches out. Perfect. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the show. You can find The Scott My Show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like, review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show.